Good evening, I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. The next few days, the theme really is clear spells and showers around, and we have that really as we end Sunday as well. Showers pushing their way in from the west, quite frequent for some western districts. Some clearer spells, though, further towards the east and a much drier night overall, though for the far northeast here in Shetland, it is going to be a much wetter one with that band of rain sweeping through. Underneath some of those clear spells, though, temperatures will just drop off a bit. Low single figures for many of us, and Apache Frost is possible first thing. On Monday morning, maybe some icy stretches as well, where we do have those showers around. We will continue to see those showers pushing their way in. They will be most frequent and heaviest for northwestern areas. Some quite blustery winds around here at times also. But generally further east and south, you'll more likely stay dry throughout the day with a decent number of sunny spells in there as well. A relatively pleasant start to the new week. Temperatures around 6 to 11 degrees Celsius is pretty much where we'd expect them to be for this time in the year. On Tuesday, we've got an area of low pressure just to the north that will again bring some very breezy, blustery showers for Scotland. But a ridge of high pressure allows for a drier, finer start for much of Northern Ireland, England and Wales with some sunny spells once again. But we will start to see the cloud thickening up from the southwest with outbreaks of rain eventually arriving turning breezier as well. But in amongst all of this, we have milder air sweeping its way in. So temperatures will be on the rise as we head towards the middle part of the week, seeing mid-teens for some of us as we head towards Wednesday. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. So a new poll has revealed that Gen Z or Gen Z, I don't know how I'm supposed to say it, and British boys and men are more likely to believe that feminism has done more harm than good when compared with older respondents. So the polling also found that a quarter of UK males aged 16 to 29 believe it's harder to be a man than a woman, with one in five looking favourably upon controversial influencer Andrew Tate. 37% of them also agree that the phrase toxic masculinity is unhelpful. So, with Gen Z boys increasingly holding this view, has feminism done more harm than good? Let me know your thoughts. Email me, gbviews at gbnews.com. Tweet me, at gbnews, and make sure you take part in our poll. But I'll bring you those results shortly. Going head-to-head -head on this tonight, our author and commentator, Anna May Mangan, and YouTuber and social media influencer, Pearl Davis. Both of you, thank you very much. Pearl, I'll start with you. Has feminism done more harm than good, especially when it comes to these Gen Z boys? Um, yes, yes, it has. I, feminism really has turned into a bunch of crybaby women that want to complain that we're not given equal opportunity when really women are given more opportunity than men. Um, and so, yeah, I would say feminism is a hate group and it's a bunch of crybaby women. Uh, Anna, would you like to come back to that? Crybaby women feminism, apparently. So we've got a right lad with us tonight with Pearl, in her opinion, haven't we? How could it possibly do harm? Pearl wouldn't do... I hope you vote. I assume you do. I hope you're not chained to the kitchen sink at home. Um, I'm not sure if you've got a job. I'm sorry, I don't know very much about you. But uh, you're pro if there's a bloke doing the same thing as you, you're probably earning less than him. So, of course, feminism is something that... It got us the vote in the first place, and it's still doing a power of good. It's just whingy men... And actually, I, I changed that. They're lads, they're not men. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good evening, I'm Sam Francis, live in the GB newsroom. The headlines at nine o'clock. 
Well, in a call this evening, the US president has urged the Israeli prime minister to halt his planned invasion of the Gazan city of Rafah. Joe Biden said that it shouldn't go ahead without a credible plan in place to protect the one million people seeking shelter there. It follows Biden's recent comments that Israel's response in Gaza is over the top. And here in the UK, the government's also warning there would be catastrophic consequences for civilians if an assault on Rafah goes ahead. However, the Israeli Prime Minister has told reporters today that enough of the 132 remaining hostages are alive to warrant that ground invasion. Earlier, tanks and bulldozers could be seen operating along the Israel-Gaza border. And it comes after at least 44 people, including several children, died yesterday in what the Palestinians have claimed was an Israeli airstrike. Here in the UK, the family of murdered teenager Brianna Jai have been holding a vigil today to mark the first anniversary of her death. Earlier, I spoke to our northwest of England reporter Sophie Reaper, who was at that gathering. Well, one year on from the tragic death of Brianna Jai, hundreds of people have gathered here in Warrington for a vigil in her memory. We heard from several of Brianna's friends who spoke, bringing tears to the eyes of the crowd as they remembered their friend. We also heard from the head teacher at Brianna's school. We finally heard from Brianna's mother, Esther, who spoke emotionally and emotively about the loss of her daughter. Here's what she had to say. Brianna was an amazing, unique and joyful teenager. I will be forever thankful that I was lucky enough to spend 16 years with her. She taught me so much and gave me so much happiness and love. If there's one piece of advice that I can give to any parent, it would be to hug your children tight and never stop telling them that you love them. Well, uh, in the last couple of hours or so, we've heard that four boys aged between 12 and 14 have been arrested today in Rochdale on suspicion of raping a young girl. The alleged incident took place in the Newbold area of Rochdale. Police say the victim is being supported by specialist officers. A spokesperson for Greater Manchester Police said that officers were called at about 6 o'clock on Saturday evening to reports of that assault. The suspects, we understand, are a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old and two 14-year-olds. They are currently in police custody. A crime scene remains in place. A man and a woman have tonight been charged after an eight-year-old boy was seriously injured in a confirmed now XL bully attack. Merseyside police say the boy is in a serious but stable condition in hospital after receiving treatment for serious head injuries. Doctors say his injuries are life-changing. 49-year-old Amanda Young and 30-year-old Lewis Young have been charged with being in charge of a dog of dangerously out of control and causing injury, though they're not related to the victim. The government is set to block bonuses paid to water bosses whose firms pollute rivers, lakes and seas. The move comes after public anger in recent months at bosses pocketing more than £26 million in bonuses, benefits and incentives over the last four years. The proposed ban by Ofwat could apply to CEOs and all executive board members. As we've heard today, 124 migrants crossed the English Channel yesterday on three small boats, according to new figures. The latest arrivals brings the total for the year to just over 1,500. That's down, though, from just over 2,000 this time last year, but up on the figure in 2020. Apart from the latest crossings, small boats had not been intercepted since 31st of January. The Prime Minister, you'll remember, has made stopping the boats a key pledge of his leadership as we approach the general election. And uh, finally, just take a look at this footage here from social media that's captured as a large crowd surrounded a self-driving taxi in San Francisco and decided to set it on fire. You can see there uh, the scenes in San Francisco. The local fire department say that fireworks were thrown inside the vehicle that started that blaze. The taxi was one of Google's self-driving vehicles as the tech giant tries to expand its driverless service across the US. But uh, robot car companies have run into some resistance from those who fear the technology is unproven and the vehicles pose a safety risk. I think I'll walk home later. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com forward slash alerts. Now, though, it's time for Mark.
Thanks, Sam, on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my big opinion, the blind push for diversity is seeing military bosses recruiting from overseas to hit targets. Our national security is becoming national insanity. Should Rishi Sunak bring Boris Johnson back into frontline politics to rescue his political fortunes? I'll be asking Boris Johnson's biographer, Tom Bauer. My Mark Meets guest is SAS hero Rusty Furman, who risked life and limb in the Falklands and Northern Ireland. He tells his extraordinary story about this extraordinary regiment shortly. In my take at 10, the dream of home ownership is now beyond the reach of millions of Brits. And the cost of rent is becoming a national scandal. If we don't start building houses and fast, this country is finished. Should Nigel Farage step in and help the Tories or leave them to disintegrate? I'll be asking former government minister Anne Widdicombe. Plus, at tomorrow's front pages at 10.30. With three top pundits who haven't been told what to say and who don't follow the script. Tonight, former Labour special adviser Paul Richards, ex-BBC chief political correspondent John Sargent and journalist and communications adviser Linda Jubilee. Tonight, I'll be asking my pundits with reported tensions between Keir Starmer and his shadow chancellor, Rachel Reeves, over the now axed £28 billion green revolution, and with fury from backbenchers over Starmer's Israel position, would a Labour government descend into civil war? Plus, the most important part of the show, your emails, they come straight to my laptop, mark at gbnews.com. And this show has a golden rule, we don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. A big two hours to come and we start with my big opinion. As Sergeant Fraser told Captain Mannering in the classic wartime sitcom Dad's Army, we're doomed. The British Army wants to relax security checks for recruits from overseas in order to boost diversity and inclusion. This according to an exclusive from the Sunday Telegraph. Britain's armed forces have consistently failed to hit recruitment targets and are looking overseas to boost ethnic minority representation, which currently stands at 14 per cent of the regular army. A document leaked to the paper entitled The British Army's Race Action Plan notes that the army struggles to attract top talent from ethnic minority backgrounds into the officer corps. Now, diversity is important. Diversity of background, diversity of opinion, diversity of faith, of lived experience, you name it. No organisation should be homogenous or closed to any groups or be guilty of one-sided ideological groupthink. But in our, in our increasingly dangerous world, do we really want to compromise security checks on those who seek to serve in the British Armed Forces and take up arms on our behalf? People from all backgrounds should be encouraged to participate in the military and the job should be made attractive to everyone. But in the end, do you really care who defends your country, who puts their life on the line as long as someone does? The defence of our territorial boundaries, which were threatened in two world wars, shouldn't become a box-ticking exercise. Of course, the only people that helps is tyrants around the world, like Vladimir Putin, who, let me tell you, is not sweating the small stuff over how diverse the Russian military are as his troops rampage across Ukraine. Military recruitment is at an all-time low, and the focus should not be the racial, religious or cultural profile of the people that we're asking to do a difficult and dangerous job, but it should be about getting the numbers up and choosing the best people for the job. Shipping people from overseas to fulfil quotas strikes me as dishonest. It's cooking the books, frankly, all in order to fulfil the unwavering political mantra that diversity is our strength. Ultimately, we're weakening ourselves with all of this nonsense. Who could forget the shocking story last year which revealed that white men seeking to join the Royal Air Force were described as useless white male pilots. A number of selection boards to place new recruits on courses were cancelled as they did not include women or ethnic minorities. This insanity proved to be against the law, with the RAF paying out thousands to applicants who have been unfairly disadvantaged because of their gender or the colour of their skin. 
Sky News revealed at the time that Group Captain Elizabeth Nicholl, the then head of RAF recruitment, had resigned in protest of what she deemed to be an unlawful order, effectively pausing the selection of white male recruits to hit what she described as impossible diversity targets. When the military go woke, you know you're in trouble because, let me tell you, the Taliban are not woke. ISIS are not woke. They don't worry about pronouns. The Iranian regime is not woke. And Vladimir Putin is a lot of things, but woke he is not. Yet. And he'll be chuckling to himself about this story as he sips his evening vodka. It's the military's job to go out there and kill the enemy. But with this nonsense coming from the MOD, it feels increasingly like the enemy is within. This is a war on common sense, and Britain's national security is turning into national insanity. So, the last word goes to Private Fraser. We're doomed. <laughs> Don't be quiet, Fraser. We're doomed, I tell you. Your reaction, Mark, at gbnews.com. I'll get to your email shortly. But first, my top pundits, former Labour special adviser Paul Richards, ex-BBC chief political correspondent John Sargent, and journalist and communications adviser Linda Jubilee. Linda, your reaction to the news that the MOD are looking to recruit from overseas in order to fulfil military diversity targets? I think it's completely ridiculous because, actually, one of the things you do have to think about when you are leading uh, an army or part of an army is... Um, is a certain loyalty, if you like, to the country. We've all seen what happens in Ukraine and how they've been able to stand up to Russia, and that's because they're completely behind their leader. That's point one. Point two is it's OK to have a campaign constructed at appealing to a wide range of people, but at the end of the day, you have to recruit the best people. And you mentioned in your monologue, well, you know, the Taliban aren't woke. Well, I can tell you, I spent two years with women who were evacuated off the tarmac at Kabul airport after mm. the Taliban invaded, and the Taliban would no sooner adopt a diversity strategy than fly to the moon on a Kalishnikov. Yes. I mean, Paul, I'm concerned about this. National security is, is becoming a national joke. Well, if you look at any history of the British Armed Forces, you will know that we've always drawn people from all over the world. Where do you think the... Gurkha Regiment come from. But not, They're not coming out of diversity stoke, targets, they, Mark? Paul. And what about the Anzacs? And what about the Fijians who serve in the British Army? And what about the people from all over the world that have served in our forces in two world wars that you mentioned? This is not new at all, and we've always drawn strength the box from people ticking that want to is serve new, under our colours. The box ticking is new. Well, uh, let's get under the, the skin of this story, because I don't think it's quite as it seems. But the idea that you, you live abroad and you can't serve in the British Armed Forces has always been a nonsense. We've always had people from all over the world who've uh, been proud to serve as British soldiers. OK, well, John Sargent, in your best-selling autobiography, Give Me Ten Seconds, you railed against a culture of box-ticking at the BBC. Are the MOD guilty of the same crime? They are, but I think it's more a sort of a real problem, as with all the public sector crises. This is about recruitment and about money. Mm. And when you get into that, all the factions and all the difficulties that then arise bubble to the surface and then come onto the media. Of course, there are people in the army who are very worried about the standard of their, their, their people they're coming into there, there. Other people are saying, oh, let's get them from overseas. It is the NHS writ large, isn't it? You know, we need more doctors. Where do we get them from? It takes a long time to train people to the levels that you need them to operate. Change is going on in the MOD like never before. Once the Russians invade Ukraine and a conventional war starts up, so many of the deep assumptions of the MOD are turned, uh, turned upside down.
So I think we should imagine that, uh, going back to Dad's army, the shouts of don't panic mm. are really what they're talking about. They don't quite know what to do. And in these circumstances, people say, oh, make sure it's diversity. They're, no, 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 we can't have diversity. They really are running around not knowing quite what to do. I'm but Linda, Linda Jubilee, do you think the military should have diversity targets? Because I think all they need a target of is brave people willing to fight for this country. Yeah, and I tell you what, I would like to respond to something Paul said, and, and, and after all, I wasn't born in this country, I was born in Canada, which is, you know, part of the Commonwealth, part of the great British Empire, and at the end of the day, you go and ask them, ask some of those soldiers or the descendants of those soldiers that went over the top at Gallipoli, ask some of those other soldiers who were in some of the Asian battalions during the First World War, how comfortable were they and how were they treated when they fought for the British Army? Mm. I'm not saying a small thing, I'm not saying an emotional thing. I think when you fight for a country, you have to have a level of endeavour and, and loyalty and trust to be able to do it properly. Now, you could do it. You could wage a successful recruitment campaign, but it's not that easy just to go out there hiring, you know, on the fly. It's also In, not easy to do it quickly. No. That's the problem. Uh, yes. You get people's loyalty to the regiment, loyalty to the country, prepared to be, take orders, whatever the orders mm. are, even if you may die. The, the whole thing requires an enormous amount of effort and concentration to get people into that peak, to that condition, so they will go and be prepared to die. It's not like any Indeed. other job. Uh, Paul Richards, uh, uh, we can agree that diversity is a very good and important thing, but I think diversity targets in the military are dangerous and potentially unlawful, as we saw with that RAF story. And also there's talk of diluting security rules in order to bring people in from overseas, which a couple of top military figures have said is a terrible idea. I don't think anyone's suggesting that you sort of dilute the quality of the soldier. You're just saying that you open up those pathways to uh, people from abroad. Well, they're, they're talking, uh, hang on, just to clarify, hang on, Paul, they're must... talking about diluting the security checks on potential well, we don't know overseas what the checks employees. are. Maybe there are. Maybe that's a box-ticking exercise that we don't need to go through either. But well, I would also say security. you did say something important, Mark, which is about um, homegrown recruitment too, because um, there are a lot of people who should be in the forces uh, but don't quite know how to do it. They don't seem as an attractive option anymore. Yeah. We have demilitarised our society um, to a record low point. And I think you know we are going to have to have a bigger army, navy and air force in the future. OK, fascinating debate. Well, uh, what's your view, Mark, at gbnews.com? Should the military have diversity targets? But next up, in the big story, should Rishi Sunak bring back Boris Johnson into frontline politics to rescue his political fortunes? I'll be asking Boris Johnson's biographer, Tom Bauer, plus we'll discuss the implications of King Charles's cancer diagnosis for the rest of his reign. That's next. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3 p.m. Welcome to the show. Superb stuff, great footage. So you're right in the thick of it there. What's the mood on the ground? Well, I've left there now. I've actually now come to that EU Council summit that I was talking about. Um, it's still pretty chaotic. The entire city of Brussels has been completely clogged with these tractors, sort of three abreast in most of the roads across the city. The people of Brussels aren't particularly happy. I mean, this is sort of reminiscent for some people of the Just Stop Oil protests, you know, people gluing themselves, people are unable to get to hospital appointments. And there's a lot of upset about the destruction that's happening on the streets of Brussels today. But on the other side, there's also the protests, which the farmers are saying that EU green laws simply are not able uh, to fit with what they need to do to keep their businesses going. And just before the protests happened, we saw the European Commission actually make some concessions to the farmers' protests. And this is on the, the demands that were put on them to set aside somewhere in the region of 5% of their land for regrowing for biodiversity. Mm -hmm. 
a lot of the farmers have said that's not possible and the European Commission has said that they can delay that coming in. So they have won a small concession with these protests. And Jack, there's a feeling as well, a huge dissatisfaction that the European Union has managed to find 50 billion euros in aid to send to Ukraine. And yet farmers in particular on the, on the receiving end of net zero targets, taxation on diesel and endless red tape. So many farmers, Jack, saying they're measuring ditches to see if they have to drain them or not. There are minimum requirements on the width of battery hen um, enclosures. And Endless red tape, as Jeremy Clarkson pointed out in Clarkson's form in Britain. They've simply had enough and they're shouting, Ursula von der Leyen, we are here. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Well, a big reaction to my big opinion with a Telegraph story suggesting that the Ministry of Defence are seeking to uh, import and employ overseas uh, personnel to join the military, the army in particular, in order to fulfil diversity targets. So, should the military have diversity targets at all? Uh, your reaction is coming in thick and fast. Uh, Bryce says, we are doomed, Mark. The question on everyone's lips is who's making these woke decisions? Government, civil service, Mandarin? Can't we just find them and sack them? Mark says, uh, good evening, Mark. The pay is not good enough for the forces. My son served for years and said that the jobs done by armed forces personnel at a poorly paid rate sometimes trebled when done by an outsider. Uh, better we pay... Uh, would boost recruitment, uh, says Mark. Thank you for that. And uh, a couple more emails I'll get to very shortly. Mark at gbnews.com. But first, it's time for the big story. And the Sun newspaper report that a Tory minister has called for Boris Johnson to make a shock comeback into government. Andrew Griffith suggested the XPM could be a secret weapon in taking on Sakir Starmer in an election campaign, telling LBC Radio he's a strong voice that would have Keir Starmer running scared. Allies of Johnson want Rishi Sunak to give Johnson a peerage so he can be brought into the cabinet like David Cameron. Meanwhile, in an interview with ITV News, the Prime Minister himself refused to rule out a return to the political front line for his former colleague, with Sunak adding, I'm proud of the work that Boris and I did together and we worked well together for a long time. So... Could recruiting Boris Johnson save Rishi Sunak's political fortunes? Kwasi Kwarteng certainly thinks so. He spoke to Camilla Tomine this morning on GB News. If you want somebody's help, you should reach out to them. Yes. That's what you would do. Yes. If you were in a difficult spot and you wanted a friend to help you or somebody to help you, yeah. you would probably well, pick up the phone. Well, he might not want or... to admit that he needs well, the help from that his ego. former nemesis. There's all of that ego and, and nonsense. It's not time simply to more, more, you know, more of the same. No. Something has to change for us to have a chance of winning. And if that means swallowing uh, some pride and you know, suppressing a bit of ego and reaching out to someone who's an approved campaigner, yeah. then he should do that. So should Boris enter the cabinet and return to frontline politics to save Sunak's skin? Let's ask top biographer and journalist Tom Bauer, whose best-selling book about Boris Johnson is called The Gambler and is out now. Tom, great to see you again. Uh, do you think that Boris should have a crack at frontline politics once again? Would, would he relish a return to the Cabinet, for example? I'm sure he would relish it, be called back from the wilderness like Winston Churchill. The problem is, though, that he is so vulnerable because he was kicked out of Parliament, accused and convicted of lying. And he did pretty badly at the Covid inquiry. He looked like mm. a broken man. And he'd be so vulnerable to Labour attacks but I don't think that for very much of the time he'd be a great asset. And I think there are two other problems with Boris. I don't think he's come to terms yet why he lost office. I mean, there's the man who won this phenomenal 80-seat majority in 2019. He made Keir Starmer at that time unelectable, and everything has gone upside down. 
and he hasn't come to terms and doesn't understand why he failed. So I think he'd find it very difficult to take to the road, especially when he wasn't very impressive in the COVID inquiry. And that's really the problem. I don't think the old Boris is there yet. He may recover, but he's not there yet. And it's an interesting question, isn't it, Tom, about whether Boris would help or hinder Sunak on the campaign trail? There has to be a concern he might overshadow the PM. Well, I think that's true. I mean, he's pretty exuberant. And the problem is that Boris is not a team player. He would not want to accept that he is actually subject to what Sunak wants. He'd go off on a tangent. And that makes him a pretty unreliable person at this time. I mean, Sunak is in the position he's in because he's blown every opportunity of setting up a proper Tory manifesto, low taxes and all the rest of it. He and Jeremy Hunt seem intent on keeping taxation far too high and not presenting a vision other than banning smoking for children, which seems to me not on everyone's thoughts at the moment. So I don't know what Boris would actually contribute other than being a distraction. Indeed, and I guess uh, Boris is probably enjoying making some money now, Tom, and being a free man. Well, of course he's enjoying. He's spending a fortune on his home and he's got lots more children and all the rest of it. But I'm sure he hankers to be back in the spotlight. There's nothing he'd like more mm. than a call from Sunak to say, please come and save me. Uh, what his reaction would be, though, would be, I'll save you on my terms. And those terms undoubtedly wouldn't suit Rishi Sunak. The problem is it's been hasn't been enough time to, for Boris to actually calm down and take stock, understand what he did wrong and come back with a fresh mandate and as a different person. He's still, unfortunately, the person who is angry with everybody and blames everybody for his own folly. Tom, of course, it was Rishi Sunak's resignation as Chancellor that saw the collapse of Johnson's premiership. Is there still bad blood between the two of them, do you think? Absolutely. I'm sure that's the right part of the problem. Boris blames everybody but himself. But you've got to remember that the reason that Sunak called it a day was after uh, Pincher was proven to have uh, uh, been guilty of this sin and Boris lied about it. And there was a constant drip of apologies because of the parties and everything else. Boris, every day he appeared every time he appeared at the dispatch box in the Commons, apologised. He became the best apologist in British politics. He never actually got on with governing Britain. And many of the problems we're facing today all occurred because Boris didn't fix Brexit. Boris didn't get rid of woke Britain. He didn't get rid of all the civil servants who were undermining the Tory government. I mean, he failed as a prime minister, having succeeded in that brilliant election coup. So it's very hard to see what he would bring to the party other than being a great rabble rouser for a little short period before he's called out again. Now, Tom, you're also a best-selling royal biographer. We hope the king makes a full recovery. But will Charles's cancer diagnosis forever alter the course of his reign? I fear it will. I fear that uh, Charles, uh, when he came to the throne was already dubbed the caretaker king because he's 75 now and obviously there's a, a limit on what how long he could reign. And I fear that he is now somewhat wounded. I think the public wish him well. I think the public don't want him to feel in any way inhibited. But by nature, the point is that when you face such a challenge as cancer, your psychology changes. And uh, I think it'll always be now seen as a king with a question mark over how long he can reign. However, I think he's got a very loyal son in William who will not be pushing, so to speak, that his father step aside. I think William would like to be the, the father of three children and the rest for a lot, lot longer. Yeah. But, you know, uh, King Charles hasn't even got his face on the stamps yet. King Charles doesn't even have his face on the coins that I've got in my pocket yet. So it's so early in the reign, it's such bad luck for him. Mm. I would be sympathetic towards that, but there is a problem. This is a testing time, of course, for his wife, Queen Camilla. How do you think she will cope? Because uh, you've spoken to me in the past, Tom, uh, and you said she doesn't enjoy the very best health herself. Well, I think that's true. We won't go into the suspected illnesses of the Queen. But, however, I think she's stepped up amazingly. 
I mean, I'm a great critic of uh, Camilla for what she did before the coronation and there, uh, because I felt that she hadn't treated Diana well, etc. But there's no doubt that ever since she has become queen, and now in the last weeks, knowing that uh, King Charles wasn't well, she really has worked very hard. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't been easy for her because she does tire easily and hates uh, long distance uh, travel with jet lag and things. So I think we should be very fortunate, as is the king, because he relies on Camilla you know, to jolly him along, to tell him to get on with life, not be maudlin and all the rest of it. So I think we should be grateful that she is by his side, that she is keeping him sane, so to speak, and he'll do his best. You know, he's a man of great strength. He's spiritual. He has a lot of interests. I'm sure he's greatly determined to push ahead and put this behind him and prove that he can be a monarch who imposes his own philosophy on the history of Britain. Uh, would King Charles ever consider relinquishing the throne, or do you think that he will go all the way like his mother? Oh, no, he won't abdicate. And it wouldn't be in the interest of the monarchy or of Britain for him to abdicate. And there's no reason mm. for it, you know. I mean, God, we've had the most amazing progress in cancer treatment now. And uh, whatever the suspected cancer is, there's so many treatments available now, and apparently it's been caught early. So let's be optimistic and hope that by Christmas is all over, and he's, uh, I mean, not by Christmas, I mean by the summer, uh, that he and uh, the Prince of Wales, Kate, are back uh, working, serving the country, and keep putting the best foot forward for Britain. I think that's what we should all hope for. Uh, last but not least, Tom, you've written a cracking autobiography, a biography, a biography of Meghan Markle. Uh, what does this shock health scare in relation to the King do in terms of the dynamic of the relationship between Harry and his family? Does it change anything? Well, I think it does. I, uh, uh, when uh, Harry announced he was doing his dash across the Atlantic last Tuesday, I said many times how suspicious I was. I didn't believe he was coming really for his own father or in any way a charitable quest to be by his father's side. And I was proved right. You can't trust the Sussexes. Everything is done in their interest, self-interest, and they have been absolutely poisonous in their treatment and their comments about Britain and the monarchy. Repeatedly, we've gone through it all so many times. It's dreadful. And I do hope that now, when Harry was sort of, so to speak, kicked out after 30 minutes, having flown from California, not invited to stay the night in any of the many palace bedrooms, and then scuttled back to California the following morning, I think he's by now got the message. He's not welcome in Britain. And I just hope that when King Charles recovers, that he finally puts paid to the Sussexes, takes away their titles or whatever, but tells them very firmly they're not welcome in Britain. So, Tom, it's your interpretation that Harry was snubbed by his own father in that 30-minute meeting? Oh, absolutely. I think he volunteered to come because he didn't want to appear in Las Vegas, not having visited his father, so to speak. But remember, he was absolutely silent for two weeks after the prostate uh, uh, revelation was publicised. He never said he wished his father well or anything. Why did he suddenly dash over? It was all in self-interest. It was a gimmick. It was to get publicity. It was to show that he was the dutiful son to his American uh, few supporters. Don't let us in any way think that this was because he feels any warmth towards his father or the royal family. After all, I'm sure Queen Camilla didn't see him. Prince William certainly didn't want to see him. He hasn't got many friends left in England. He's cut them all off. He's, a, he's an outsider. He's an outcast. And uh, he should be firmly told not to bother to come back anymore. Tom Bauer, always a delight to have you on the show. Catch up soon. My thanks to royal biographer and, of course, Boris Johnson's biographer, Tom Bauer. Uh, coming up with reported tensions between Keir Starmer and his shadow chancellor, Rachel Reeves, over the now axed £28 billion green revolution, would a Labour government descend into civil war? I'll we'll debate that next. Plus, in an exclusive Mark Dolan tonight people's poll, we've been asking, as it's revealed, military chiefs are recruiting from overseas to hit diversity targets. Is wokery compromising Britain's national security? Well, the results are in. I shall reveal all next.
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Every Wednesday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's Questions when Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer go head-to-head -head in the House of Commons. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Farage, Monday to Thursday, from 7pm. Lots of people have different ideas, mm -hmm. but principally, a conservative approach to getting growth is to reduce taxes so that people, ordinary people and businesses, can spend more of their own money to invest and grow the economy. So the theory is that you cut taxes and that then pumps more money exactly right. into the economy. Exactly the right. Growth. And then people, you know, it's not government that are creating wealth. It's individuals, businessmen, companies that create wealth. It's the private sector that creates wealth, that the public sector then taxes and, and, and spends. I get the theory, but one of the criticisms of you, sure. and I think one of the criticisms actually of all political parties, is they appear to be incapable of cutting government spending. That's the key. I mean, and, and I think when I look back, is that we should have had a, a, a credible plan to reduce the increase in spending. Mm. Now, that's often a difficult concept to explain. But it's in line with inflation, etc. That's all right. So, yeah. so when, you, when, you, when you're slowing the increase, it means, you know, one year you spend £100, and the next year you spend maybe £101, as opposed to going up to £110. So the, the, the actual level isn't going down, but you're slowing the increase. And that's very much what mm. I tried to do. And actually, looking back, the one thing I wish we'd done, I'd done, was to present a credible spending uh, plan at the same time as the tax cuts that we, that we announced. You had a go. It didn't work out for whatever reason. For, yeah. and, 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 and that analysis will go on for some for a years while, yes. to come. We have Jeremy Hunt uh, there as Chancellor now, hinting quite strongly now there won't be any tax cuts. But the truth of it is, under 14 years of Conservatives, for a variety of reasons, the tax burden has risen that's right. to the highest since the Attlee government way back yeah, in 80 years, 1951, years, yeah, whatever right. it is. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Hi, Rishi here. As Prime Minister, I'm focused on delivering on your priorities. So I'll be on the road to join GB News for a special People's Forum on Monday the 12th of February, where I'll be taking questions from a live audience about the issues that really matter to you. The economy, immigration, the NHS. See you there. Now, in an exclusive Mark Dolan Tonight People's Poll, we've been asking as it's revealed military chiefs are recruiting from overseas to hit diversity targets. Is wokery compromising Britain's national security? Well, the results are in. And 91.3% of you say yes, whilst 8.7% say no. Now... Following Labour's decision to axe their £28 billion a year plan for a green revolution, speculation is growing about tension between Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, and his shadow chancellor, Rachel Reeves. The Sunday Times today report that behind the scenes, things have become difficult between the pair, with robust discussions over the cost of Labour's plans for the environment. Others have been more vocal in their condemnation of the U-turn, with Labour MP Barry Gardner describing the decision as economically illiterate and environmentally irresponsible. Meanwhile, restless Labour backbenchers remain unhappy with Keir Starmer's robustly pro-Israel position in regards to the military conflict in Gaza. So, will Labour descend into civil war should they achieve power? Let's ask tonight's top pundits. Former Labour special adviser Paul Richards 
ex-BBC chief political correspondent John Sargent and journalist and communications advisor Linda Jubilee. Well, look, you've been part of the Labour nerve machine, Paul Richards. Your reaction to this story, is there any truth in it regarding a rift between Starmer and Reeves? Well, I can exclusively reveal that there is no stronger relationship in politics than that between Keir and Rachel. I mean, they are the absolute epicentre of Labour's recovery over the last three years, four years, um, and they'll be at the epicentre of a Labour government if there is one. So this is absolute nonsense. I mean, the Sunday Times are reporting that it was originally Rachel Reeves's idea to make this commitment of £28 billion a year for a green revolution. The story suggests that she wanted to make a splash with a headline figure and that Starmer was concerned about this approach from day one. Well, Rachel's a pretty sharp cookie and she knows what it'll be like if she is the first uh, woman, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, first Labour one for a quite a while. When she opens the books, she knows there is not much headroom. The Tories have taxed, uh, have maxed out the credit card um, and there isn't going to be loads of money to splash about on even good causes like, uh, you know, green technology. So she is getting in her retaliation first and she is basically making sure that Labour has a credible financial position going into an election. And if she hadn't done that, you know, the Tories would have said it would cost us all X number of pounds per week extra. They'd have done the tax bombshell mm. um, stunt yet again. And, and she knows that this next election is not a done deal and Labour's not over the line yet. So that's the context for this. It's not about the environment. It's actually about winning an election so you can do something about the environment. Uh, well, there you go. Linda Jubilee, uh, Reeves and Starmer have put on a united front. They've denied this story. But is there trouble in paradise? I think the problem rests on the fact that they put a figure on this to start with. And I know why figures are very attractive, because mm. they can grab a headline, they resonate, people understand a big figure, or they think they do. The problem is you hold yourself a hostage to fortune. Now, having said that, I don't think there's anything wrong in reconsidering that figure or reconsidering how that impacts upon their green policy, because at the end of the day, any financially responsible person will change that figure when the circumstances change. And what we have to accept here is circumstances have changed very, very radically, and we all have to recalibrate over our finances. But can I pick you up on that, Linda? Because the economy was in the toilet when Labour came up with this policy in 2021. But it's got worse, hasn't it? So you could expect some sort of recalibration. Look, I'm not saying they've done a great job. Personally, I think putting a figure on this to start with it was a bad idea. It's not something I would advise anyone to do. As I've said, you're holding yourself a hostage to fortune. Mm. But having put the figure in there, I don't think it's unusual that you would recalibrate in the circumstances. Uh, John Sargent, this U-turn is a political disaster for Keir Starmer. Does it suggest cracks at the top? No, it suggests incompetence, I'm afraid. I mean, the way it was all handled was completely wrong from the beginning. Putting the 28 billion out to excite people, sure, two and a half years later, takes all this time to then manoeuvre away from that figure. Now, that's one of the arts of politics, isn't it? Manoeuvre. And if you want the military connection, retreat is the hardest manoeuvre to do. Mm. So, I mean, I, I know the difficulties, I know the problems they had, but it couldn't have been worse. And when, when Paul says this is the great, you know, the closest relationship in politics, do you remember one of the last closest relationships in politics? Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. I mean, the differences between the Prime Minister and the Chancellor is almost bound to be there. So you, uh, you ask the simple question, will they disagree when they're in government? Well, frankly, they're bound to. Will that disagreement matter? Well, it depends on all sorts of other factors. But there will be conflict. Those, these are big issues, and they will come up again and again. Uh, Paul Richards, briefly, if you can, uh, Barry Gardner, a highly respected, high-profile Labour backbencher, has said that the U-turn was economically illiterate, economically catastrophic. Uh, you've got a by-election, Labour by-election candidate suggesting that Israel allowed mm. the October the 7th massacre to happen as some kind of conspiracy. He's apologised, but he's still the by-election candidate for Labour. And you've got backbenchers not happy with Keir Starmer's pro-Israel position. It doesn't sound very harmonious for a party getting ready for power. I think if uh, Azhar Ali wins in Rochdale, uh, the first thing that needs to happen is that he has the Labour whip taken off him.
Uh, he can't, you can't get him off the ballot paper now. It is now a choice between him or mm. Galloway, and I'd rather have the Labour candidate in place. But he does have to be disciplined for this because it was a disgraceful thing mm. to say or think or even contemplate, uh, and he does need to be punished. You know, Starmer has said we're going to root out anti-Semitism, um, and that he has to keep doing that, uh, it would seem. Um, the party is united at the moment. I mean, these poll leads of 22 points do give us a bit of a spring in our step. I think we're going to do really well in these by-elections that are coming up in a few weeks. Mm. Um, and I think that will help with unity, okay. because people like to be on the winning side, don't they? Mm. Mm. Oh, Fascinating yeah. stuff. Uh, your reaction, Mark, at gbnews.com. Do you think that a Labour government would be harmonious? Let's be honest, the current one isn't very, is it? So uh, let me know your thoughts. But uh, in my take at 10, looking forward to this, the dream of home ownership is now beyond the reach of millions of Brits. And the cost of rent is becoming a national scandal. If we don't start building houses and fast, this country is finished. But next up, my Mark Meets guest is SAS hero Rusty Furmin, who risked life and limb in the Falklands and Northern Ireland. He tells his extraordinary story about this extraordinary regiment next. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. When you listen to Nigel Farage's assessment there, do you feel that maybe this is as good as it was going to get given that we had the pandemic and it was inevitably always going to be a bit of a mixed bag? Well, I think it's a bit of a poor excuse from Nigel there that uh, they haven't done it properly. The facts are, Nigel, that it's not worked. It's not going to work. Yes, we will rejoin. I mean, are we better off for it? Are, are they... Can I jump in there, Charlie? We're going to rejoin under which government? Because Labour aren't going to do that, unless you don't think... Well, but, but, I mean, it's going to be unavoidable not to join, because I think it's getting worse and worse for us. I mean, let me just say this. Are the NHS better because we're out of Europe? No, they're not, because they're not employing more staff. Is the building trade better off? No. Is travelling abroad or to the EU or staying in the EU, are we better off? No. Are we better off because foods rise because of the EU? No. Are we better off with imports and export? No, because they're taking longer. The overall result is that we're not better off. The killer point here is 57% of the public will now vote to remain. 33% would leave. Surely that's the telling yeah, point. It depends on the poster, Charlie, because we were talking to a very good poster earlier who said there's no enthusiasm for any change in a year. Maybe 10 years, they might be thinking about it. Belinda de Lucy, let's yeah. bring you in. I'm sure you want to react to what Charlie said. <laughs> I mean, who would have thought that the UK wanting to run its own affairs and making our politicians more accountable would be so revolutionary? The EU Parliament voted a majority to get rid of the vetoes, the last remaining scraps of democracy that the EU had. Now, luckily uh, for, for EU citizens at the moment, you know, it means a treaty change to actually go forward. But that, that is the mood. The ever closer union, we have dodged a federalised globalist, international, power-gobbling, anti-democratic organisation. And that's worth more than a few trade and travel perks with, for a few wealthy people in this country. Hear, hear. Belinda De Lucy, <laughs> Charlie Mullins, great to see you both. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. You won't miss, want to miss my uh, take at 10. I'm furious about the state of house building in this country. But first, it's time for Mark Meets. And tonight, a true military hero, Rusty Furman, spent 15 years in the SAS and was a key figure in the Iranian embassy siege in May 1980. He also served in the Falklands and Northern Ireland during the Troubles. One of the most respected figures in the history of that brave and formidable regiment, his time serving in the forces is all documented in his best-selling book. It's called The Regiment, 15 Years in the SAS, and it's out now. Rusty Furman, welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Yep. 
Well, Lovely to see you. Uh, what is special about the SAS compared to other regiments? Um, I don't like to be big-headed about it, but actually it takes an awful lot um, to get into the SAS, and it's mm. recognised as one of the toughest courses in the world. Yeah. Um, you know, six months of gruelling, day in, day out, day in, day out, wearing you down. You know, start off with 100 guys, you might end up with 10 who's actually physically past it. That's how tough it is. So it's a six-month job interview? Yeah. If you pass the first month, right, which is the physical side of it. Yeah. And then you go further down the line and do everything else. And basically it's wearing you down day in and day out, all the way through, until they've got what's left. And what they've got left is what they push out, and that's why it's been so, um, <clears throat> a successful regiment over the years in everything it does, including the counter-terrorism. Yeah, the, the elite, the elite of the British military. Uh, what attracted you to the SAS in the first place? What was happening in your life at the time you joined? Um, I was in 29 Commando, which was based in Plymouth. Mm. Um, I was a commando instructor, um, so I was out on the hills every day training new commandos to be commandos, if you like, um, going through the uh, training phases there. Um, one day, um, I got itchy feet. At that time, I was still playing football for the British Army, which is the highest level in semi-professional. What, what position? You look like a midfielder to me. I've been a midfielder and a forward. There you go. Attacking but, midfielder in the, in the kind of... Uh, yeah, sort of... kick a few. Kick a few. Yeah. yeah I like it. <laughs> Can't get away with it this day and age, but that's what I was, and that's what I was doing. Yeah. I just felt that that stage, it was, if I wasn't going to move then, I'd probably never have done it. Yeah. So I put a lot of time into the training, pre-training, and then went for it um, <clears throat> in um, 1977, did the summer selection and got through. Of course, and of course, you, you know, you were in the SES for a very important part of this country's history, uh, the Troubles in Northern Ireland and <coughs> the Falklands War in, in which you served. Uh, at the Falklands, did, did you always know that you, the UK was going to win or did you ever have doubts that I mean, we might not prevail? No, no, I, I never have doubts. Mm. Um, you know, the, the calibre of people, you, you know, you can see what happened. Um, and the guys that I served with... It was very, very quickly put together by Mrs Thatcher, the Prime Minister at the time. Mm. And, um, yeah, we took some casualties, but actually the Falkland Islands is ours and it was worth fighting for. Most definitely. How did your time in the SAS change you? It didn't really change me. Um, once I got in, I realised I had some hard work to do. Mm. But you, with the calibre of guys that are there before you bring you through yeah. if you can make it. Uh, some people don't. Even when they pass, they'll, f they'll fall up by the wayside. Um, even once you've got through... Um, so you're guided by this, the, the experience around you. If you don't learn from that, you're never going to learn at all. And then you go through, the new guys coming in then, they learn from you, and that's what we did. And you share that intelligence, that knowledge, that experience. Yeah. Um, did you ever come close to losing your life while serving in the SAS? <clears throat> yeah, down the Falklands in particular. Um, other places maybe, <laughs> didn't know about. But actually, um, yeah, when we did Operation Mikado and jumped into the South Atlantic, yeah. Um, cold place, <laughs> just bobbing around, waiting to be picked up. So, you, in, in the sea? Yeah. Uh, and in how long were you in the sea for, waiting probably for Probably about seven or eight minutes, probably. Right, in because... ice-cold water. Oh, yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's remarkable. Um, the clock's against us, but in 1980, a group of six armed men stormed the Iranian embassy in London. They were campaigning for the sovereignty of uh, Kurdistan. <laughs> they took 26 people hostage, including embassy staff and a police officer. You were part of that operation. And yep. there's somebody that's been reported about that you think is claiming to be involved but wasn't. Yeah, it's um, Norman Merrill. Mm. Unfortunately, he's deceased last year, 82 years of age, but they've had a memorial for him up in Ilkeston um, on Saturday gone, where he, they've claimed in the BBC, in um, the newspapers, the news desk. I've been in touch with them all, including the reporter who called me for a story on it and told him that this sergeant... Norman Merrill was never in the SAS. It was never in the siege, and I call it stolen valor. 
my guys, some of them are deceased right now. They were involved in that operation. So they made him out to be a hero. Um, I said I was going to report them if they didn't do something about it. Even the emails I sent to the news desk have been not even returned. So here I am sat here tonight. Well, it's a matter of national record, and thank you for putting the record straight. Listen, we're out of time, but very briefly, do you miss your time in the military? No. All right. You're happy to be out? I'm happy to be out. Well, we're happy to have you on <laughs> City Street. Thank you for telling us your amazing story. More importantly, thank you for the service that you've given to this country, Rusty. Thank you. Thanks for the invite tonight. Privilege uh, to have Rusty with us. Uh, coming up in the 10 o'clock hour, we've got the papers. And in my take at 10, the dream of home ownership is now beyond the reach of millions of Brits. It's a national scandal. If we don't start building houses and fast, this country is finished. That's my take at 10 in a few minutes' time. You won't want to miss it. Warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. The next few days, the theme really is clear spells and showers around. And we have that really as we end Sunday as well. Showers pushing their way in from the west, quite frequent for some western districts. Some clearer spells, though, further towards the east and a much drier night overall, though, for the far northeast here in Shetland, it is going to be a much wetter one with that band of rain sweeping through. Underneath some of those clear spells, though, temperatures will just drop off a bit. Low single figures for many of us. And Apache frost is possible first thing. On Monday morning, maybe some icy stretches as well. But we do have those showers around. We will continue to see those showers pushing their way in. They will be most frequent and heaviest for northwestern areas. Some quite blustery winds around here at times also. But generally further east and south, you'll more likely stay dry throughout the day with a decent number of sunny spells in there as well. A relatively pleasant start to the new week. Temperatures around 6 to 11 degrees Celsius is pretty much where we'd expect them to be for this time in the year. On Tuesday, we've got an area of low pressure just to the north that will again bring some very breezy, blustery showers for Scotland. But a ridge of high pressure allows for a drier, finer start for much of Northern Ireland, England and Wales with some sunny spells once again. But we will start to see the cloud thickening up from the southwest with outbreaks of rain eventually arriving turning breezier as well. But in amongst all of this, we have milder air sweeping its way in. So temperatures will be on the rise as we head towards the middle part of the week, seeing mid-teens for some of us as we head towards Wednesday. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. The Camilla Tomini Show. Sunday mornings from 9.30. Um, we had Grant Shapps on last week. He was talking about how defence spending is now creeping up to two and a quarter percent of GDP. Ben Wallace's uh, predecessor suggested it should be three percent. We hear that we've got the smallest army, I think, since the Napoleonic Wars. Numbers are get down. There's a question as to whether we can staff frigates in the Red Sea. Why haven't we sent aircraft carriers? What's your impression of the situation? Well, I don't think it matters how much you spend, it's how effectively you spend it. And we spend it very ineffectively. We have lots of scandals about defence spending. And I think partly because of the monopoly position of some of our defence suppliers, we don't get uh, good value and we don't get reliability. This latest story in The Telegraph is that HMS Diamond, which is our ship, which is out there uh, defending the Red Sea, doesn't have the capability of firing a missile from the ship to the land, so it can't participate in the attacks on the Houthis. So in order that we can participate in the attacks, we're flying RAF aircraft from Cyprus, yeah. which is a very long way away. Um, when I was Defence Secretary, I ordered um, cruise missiles for our nuclear-powered, uh, but not nuclear-armed, submarines. And I think we have six or possibly seven of those. But last autumn, it was reported that five of those were out of commission, were not available. Uh, we have about 21 aggressive surface ships. So we've got two aircraft carriers and we've got frigates and we've got um, destroyers. But at any one time, you can count on about uh, half of those not being available because they're under refit or whatever. So we have a minimal uh, surface fleet now. 
And for whatever reason, it doesn't seem that we're able to deploy a submarine to the area that can fire cruise missiles. Our two aircraft carriers, built at enormous expense, are sitting in Portsmouth. Which seems to most people ludicrous, well, at least it, with what's going on. It doesn't seem state. ludicrous to me. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good evening, it's 10 o'clock on television, on radio and online in the United Kingdom and across the world. This is Mark Dolan tonight. In my take at 10, the dream of home ownership is now beyond the reach of millions of Brits, and the cost of rent is becoming a national scandal. If we don't build houses and fast, this country is finished. Also tonight, should Nigel Farage step in and help the Tories or leave them to disintegrate? I'll be asking former government minister Anne Widdicombe. Plus, tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from tonight's top pundits. We're bringing out the royalty this evening. We have former Labour special advisor Paul Richards, ex-BBC chief political correspondent, the one and only John Sargent, and journalist and common communications advisor Linda Jubilee. Lots to get through. A packed show. First, the headlines and Sam Francis. Mark, thank you very much and good evening from the GB Newsroom. It's just gone 10 o'clock and we'll start in the Middle East tonight as tensions escalate amid warnings against an Israeli invasion in Rafa in the south of Gaza. UK ministers have today said that it would be potentially catastrophic for civilians there. That's despite calls from the UK, the US, Germany and Egypt, among others, to the Israeli Prime Minister for him to abandon the offensive. In a call with the US President Joe Biden, Benjamin Netanyahu faced pressure to halt the planned invasion. Joe Biden said that there must be a credible plan to protect the 1.4 million people seeking shelter in Rafa. However, Netanyahu insists, insists enough hostages are alive to justify the ground offensive. And that comes after at least 44 people, including several children, died yesterday in what the Palestinians claim were Israeli airstrikes. Back here in the UK, the family of murdered teenager Brianna Jai have today held a vigil to mark the first anniversary of her death. Flowers, candles and a painting of Brianna were laid nearby, with many wearing pink in tribute to Brianna. Her mother, Esther, was among the many mem members of the community gathering to pay their respects. Brianna was an amazing, unique and joyful teenager. I will be forever thankful that I was lucky enough to spend 16 years with her. She taught me so much and gave me so much happiness and love. If there's one piece of advice that I can give to any parent, it would be to hug your children tight and never stop telling them that you love them. Esther Jai there, the mother of Brianna Jai, speaking earlier. Well, a man and woman have been charged today after an eight-year-old boy was seriously injured in an XL bully attack. Merseyside police say the boy is in a serious but stable condition in hospital after receiving treatment for serious head injuries. Doctors say his injuries are life-changing. 49-year-old Amanda Young and 30-year-old Lewis Young have been charged, being in charge of a dog that's dangerously out of control and causing injury. We understand, though, they're not related to the victim. 124 migrants crossed the English Channel yesterday on three small boats, according to new Home Office figures. The latest arrivals bring the total for the year so far to just over 1,500. That's down, though, on the 2,000 at this time last year, but up on the figure in 2022. Apart from the latest crossings, small boats had not been intercepted since the end of January. The Prime Minister, as you'll remember, has made stopping the boats a key pledge of his leadership as the country approaches the general election. 
In other news, the government is set to block, we understand, bonuses paid to bosses who run water firms that pollute rivers, lakes and seas. The move comes after public anger at bosses pocketing more than 26 billion million rather pounds in bonuses, benefits and incentives over the last four years. The proposed ban by the regulator off what could apply to CEOs and all executive board members. And finally, 14 people have today been injured, including two seriously, after a tree fell onto the tracks of a roller coaster in Spain. Footage here for those watching on social media, watching on TV rather, that appeared on social media, showing uh, the showing an air ambulance landing at the scene of that uh, crash site where emergency services say five people, including two, were in a critical condition taken to hospitals nearby. The Portaventura theme park, the largest in Spain, says the accident is not related to the ride safety or maintenance, but they say instead because of strong winds. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen. Or if you're listening on radio, you can go to gbnews.com forward slash alerts. Thanks, Sam. Good evening and welcome to Mark Dolan tonight. Should Nigel Farage step in and help the Tories or leave them to disintegrate? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker, former government minister Anne Widdicombe. Plus tomorrow's newspaper front pages and live reaction in the studio from my top pundits this evening. Former Labour special advisor Paul Richards, ex-BBC chief political correspondent John Sargent and journalist and communications advisor Linda Jubilee. Lots to get through. I'll be asking my pundits for their headline heroes and back page zeros of the day. And those papers are coming, plus Anne Widdicombe. But first, my take at 10. Now, I don't know whether I've got the man flu or if I had a big night last night, but I found myself agreeing with Michael Gove this morning. Speaking to the Sunday Times, the cabinet minister responsible for levelling up housing and communities told the paper that if young people can't get housing, they will abandon democracy. The political veteran, famous as much for his disco dancing as his political ruthlessness, has got himself in a bit of a spin on the dance floor about the future of society if people in their 20s, 30s and 40s have no chance of getting on the housing ladder. Although he's no John Travolta, he's absolutely right on this issue. Soon, generation rent will be most young people, and far too high a portion of ordinary people's salary goes on a roof over their head, especially for renters. Gove added that if people think that markets are rigged and that democracy isn't listening to them, then an increasing number of young people will say, well, I don't believe in democracy, I don't believe in markets. Of course, Michael Gove and his party are part of the problem. Rishi Sunak last year dropped compulsory housing targets to avoid a potential backbench Tory rebellion. He fudged the issue horribly by making a manifesto commitment to build 300,000 homes a year, but subject to local approval. Well, good luck with that. Britain is the world capital of NIMBY. In other words, not in my backyard. Michael Gove points out that since the credit crunch of 2008-2009, it's harder for people to get mortgages. Plus, foreign ownership of property, including vast housing developments picked up by the Chinese, Arabs and Russians, is hitting supply too. But the elephant in the room is population growth. Now, sensible levels of legal net migration are linked to economic prosperity and an enriched society. And with an ageing population and millions of Brits unwilling to do some of the important work in this country that needs to be done, such as the care sector and seasonal farming, you'll always need migration. But with legal net migration last year reaching almost 700,000, that's an increase in the entire population of 1% in a single year, this problem is only going to get worse, particularly given that house building can't even keep up with current demand. Last month, the Office for National Statistics forecasted that the UK population will likely reach nearly 74 million by 2036, fuelled by net migration of 6.1 million people. 6.1 million extra people. Great, 
but where are they going to live? According to the Centre for Policy Studies think tank, ONS population figures suggest that we'll need to build at least 5.7 million new homes in England over the next 15 years. Elton John's hair will grow back naturally before that happens. So what is the way forward? Well, we need a radical post-war style housing revolution. Michael Gove must accelerate his plans to allow the repurposing of office blocks, industrial estates and disused retail outlets into housing. Work from home means that millions of square feet of office space are no longer needed and people would more than happily live in those properties. Also, we need to slap a massive property tax on foreign investors, stop locals blocking construction, which they always will, and a radical plan is needed to build on brownfield and, yes, some greenfield sites, because they're not all flowery meadows. Given the fact that over 85% of UK landmass is rural, it means there's no excuse not to build baby build. Now, this should be cross-party housing, is critical infrastructure. And Labour, the Tories and even the Lib Dems should come together to make a long-term plan to house this and future generations. As Margaret Thatcher proved in the 1980s, home ownership is good for social mobility and sees people engage with democracy, society and the economy, rather than walking away from it, as Michael Gove fears. Margaret Thatcher's big mistake was not pumping right-to-buy money into building new social housing, of which we also need much, much more. Legal net migration should come down to a sensible, manageable level, ensuring that our compassion as a nation and our need for fresh blood and skilled and unskilled labour is balanced by the capacity of our infrastructure, school places, NHS beds, public transport and our ability to accommodate extra people. And we should look into build half a million, that's right, half a million high quality new homes every year for the next decade at least. Britain is a homeowning democracy with a proud history of social housing, the construction of which needs to be ramped up as well. If we don't build all types of houses and flats and fast, we are finished as a country. You know what they say, home sweet home. Well, at the moment, thanks to our useless politicians, all we're getting is Sweet F.A. There's no two ways about it, folks. We've got a build, baby, build. But your reaction, mark at gbnews.com. Let's hear from my top pundits, former Labour special adviser Paul Richards, ex-BBC chief political correspondent John Sargent, and journalist and communications adviser Linda Jubilee. Uh, John Sargent, uh, your reaction to the comments of Michael Gove, he's told the Sunday Times this morning that if young people think they can't get on the housing ladder, they're going to walk away from democracy. Yeah, I think walking away from democracy assumes they would then know where to go. So I don't think it's one of a very useful phrase. I also don't think the country would be, in your words, finished. But my gosh, you're right on all the other main points. There's got to be an enormous house building programme, or they've got to take radical action to reduce immigration and build up much more social housing. But no, the target certainly should be half a million. But people should then get behind it, and the government should know this is going to be unpopular in many areas. But they've got to have the political will to do this, which can be done by a Conservative government. It was done in the 1950s by Harold Macmillan with, you know, we will build 300,000 houses a year. And people thought, How, what an amazing figure. But they did. And it was a great success and very good politically. I can't think of a, a, you know, an issue apart from the NHS and some other things which would get people more excited than feeling that we could house the population. Yes, I don't think the Tories have uh, covered themselves in glory when it comes to house building. In fact, they've been a disaster, Paul Richards. But would Labour be any better? Sounds like you've been reading the next Labour manifesto, Mark, or maybe writing it. I don't know. But, I mean, hard to disagree with anything you said. I would say immigration is a bit of a red herring here because we've had, you know, population growth since the Romans and we've managed to house people. It's more about supply, uh, getting the planning law sorted out, uh, letting councils build uh, homes to rent for people on low incomes like nurses and teachers, but also sorting out this deposits issue because unless you've got the Bank of Mum and 
and dad, there's sort of 30, 40, 50,000 pound deposits that people need starting out to even get on the first rung of the ladder is absurd. So we need to have a, a situation where people can get on that first rung and become uh, property owners. And that's what we're all after. Uh, uh, Paul, I'm sure, you know, Labour couldn't do worse than the Tories. But let me pick you up on that issue of legal net migration. I agree the country has always been growing, but not at this rate. 700,000 in a year. That's 1% of the whole UK population. There'll be 3.5 million extra people in five years. They've got to live somewhere. But the population has always grown. and this But, but not is, at that rate, Paul. But these are people who are coming here to work and they will add to the growth of our economy, as people from all over the world coming here have okay. always done. And they'll do the jobs, as you say, that maybe some people don't want to do. Um, and also, they'll be building the houses. They'll be the people who actually we need in the construction industry as well. So it, it's nothing, nothing to fear. It is just part of the natural uh, growth of our country. Linda, can you sort this out for me? What, what's going wrong? Why don't we build houses? Well, I mean, that's all down to how much money you've got in the kitty, how much will you've got to change the planning laws, how hard you tackle local authorities, whether you really get your, your, your troops behind a good policy. But what I will tell you is, the only thing that surprised me about Ma M Michael Goh's appearance this morning on television and what he wrote in the Sunday Times is it took so long to say it. I've got three children. They've all worked really hard. They've all got bachelor's degrees. They've all got masters. One's an economist, one's in the theatre, one's an architect ironically enough, and two of the three don't believe they will get any chance of getting on the property ladder, because their older brother, who is the economist, has worked it out, until they are in their late 30s. Now, we cannot, cannot allow that continue to continue. And more importantly, the Conservative Party can't continue to disenfranchise younger voters in this way. The fact is, the Conservative Party does an awful lot to keep older voters happy, but that's not the only investment you should be making in, in who votes for you. You simply have to invest in younger voters now. And I'm telling you that I talk to my kids, I talk to younger children, and top of their list of concerns is housing. There you go. Build, baby, build. Well, my top pundits return at 10.30 sharp for tomorrow's papers. But next up, should Nigel Farage step in and help the Tories or leave them to disintegrate? I'll be asking tonight's newsmaker, former government minister Anne Widdicombe. Lots to get through. Don't go anywhere. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Uh, Chris, what is the preferred way? in which the police go about their business at the moment. There's these two strands of thinking, evidence-based policing versus bobbies on the beat. It's very, very difficult. Um, the problem that police have got, basically, is that they're too thinly spread and it's too much is expected of them. Uh, there's a long list, isn't it? Every month we hear police need to do more about this, police need to do more about that, and police do their best. They're overwhelmed with bureaucracy. I mean, when I was a young PC, if I took a shoplifter in, then I'd be in and out within an hour. You take a shoplifter in now, and you're doomed for the rest of your shift for six or seven hours dealing mm. with the bureaucracy. Police want to get back in those communities because community policing is really the core of policing. But such are the demands on their time at the moment and the bureaucracy mm. and the fact that they are struggling now to retain experienced officers. People are hemorrhaging out of the police and new recruits coming in haven't got that experience and there's a good chance they may not stay anyway. So there's all sorts of problems. And for the Home Secretary to glibly say he wants more done, frankly, clearly shows he's got no understanding of the pressure police are under. And of course, the constant criticism that they face across the board. Very rarely do you actually hear of police officers getting praised for acts of bravery or acts of compassion. 
So there's a problem with morale in the police force and clearly a problem with a Home Secretary who needs to get out there and talk to officers on the front line who frankly are struggling. And last night, of course, was a graphic example. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hi, Rishi here. As Prime Minister, I'm focused on delivering on your priorities. So I'll be on the road to join GB News for a special People's Forum on Monday the 12th of February where I'll be taking questions from a live audience about the issues that really matter to you. The economy, immigration, the NHS. See you there. I'll get to your feedback shortly regarding my take at 10 and Britain's housing crisis. But first, it's time for the newsmaker. And Nigel Farage has sensationally revealed that he receives desperate calls from Tory MPs several times a day. The GB News presenter has hinted several times about a potential return to politics, but remains undecided. Receiving a message from an unnamed Conservative backbencher on his phone during an interview with the Times newspaper, he said to the Times journalist, there's another one calling me. They're looking for something. They're desperate. I'm Uncle Nige. They all want to know what I'm going to do. So what is he going to do? Should Nigel Farage step in to help the Tories or let them disintegrate. Let's get the views of tonight's newsmaker, former government minister and reform UK supporter Anne Whittacombe. Anne, great to see you. This is a dilemma for Nigel, isn't it? The Conservative Party is the oldest and most successful party in the history of Western democracy. He might like to be part of that. No, I don't think it's a dilemma at all. First of all, they may be the oldest party uh, and they have hitherto been extremely successful. But the last four years uh, have seen a complete meltdown. Uh, and it's all very well saying, you know, should not lead the Conservatives. Um, which branch of the Conservative Party would that? You know, that there, there is not uh, a unified party there uh, for anybody to lead. And all this nonsense about how they're now going to get into this between that, the local council elections go badly wrong, as they will, will not solve their problem. Because their real problem is total disunity and a very, very second-rate collection of MPs. And by the way, the Labour Party has an equally second-rate collection, as we will find out uh, when they win the election. And we know that the Conservatives, those backbenchers, yes, they have their various ideologies. It's a broad church. But the Tories are pragmatic too, aren't they? If, if Nigel became a Tory leader, which is only possible if he joins the party, he could win them an election. The point is that they used to be pragmatic. It used to be the most pragmatic party on earth. It even got rid of Margaret Thatcher uh, when its position started to slide very badly in the pool. It had a huge instinct for self preservation. That's gone. I mean, we've had, uh, you've had kindergarten chaos now uh, for you know, four solid years, uh, and it's not going to get any better. Uh, and anybody who would take on the leadership of that party. Uh, I, I would admire hugely if I thought that they could make a real difference. But until they get together, until they realise that election victory has been thrown away, they've got a majority of 80, or well, under now, but they've got a majority of nearly 80, and they are doing absolutely nothing with it. Nothing with it. Now, of course, Anne, Nigel Farage is the honorary life president of Reform UK, but are you surprised that he hasn't ruled out joining the Conservatives? Oh, no, Nigel uh, is nothing in a very, very pleased. Uh, 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 he likes to laugh at the establishment, uh, so I'm not surprised that he's ruled it out. But there's probably also a very serious motive underneath it, which is uh, to see exactly what the strength of feeling is uh, in the Conservative Party, uh, on which reform uh, can capitalise. And if any of them want to join reform, 
that's wonderful. Well, there's a big difference between Tory joining reform and Farage joining the Tories. Now, Anne, you've uh, said on several occasions on this programme that Reform UK exists and you joined Reform UK because the Conservatives are not a proper Conservative Party anymore. But if Britain is so ready for true Conservatism, why are they about to elect a Labour government? Because the current Conservative Party is utterly unelectable. It's done nothing except navel gaze and fight them on itself. It's got very few real achievements to, you know, to put on the, uh, the record book and to say this is what we've done when the election comes along. And so, of course, people are fed up. People are very fed up. I mean, actually, nobody is more conservative with a small C than people in the Red Wall. Uh, and they will likely go back to Labour because they've been completely let down by what they thought was going to be a common-sense Conservative Party in which they turned out It'd be a ridiculous part. Ridiculous. And you're wearing Tory blue today and you look absolutely marvellous. Uh, could you rule Thank out you. ever returning to Conservative Party if they had a set of policies and a philosophy to which you adhered? Well, I mean, the, the simple fact of, of life is that I go where um, I, I agree with most of the policies. You're never going to agree with 100%, but where I agree with most of the policies. So in a hypothetical world, uh, you know, if reform disappeared and the Conservatives rejuvenated, uh, of course I would look at it, but that ain't going to happen. You've got a circus at Westminster. It's a circus, and it's people by clowns. Too many elephants as well. And uh, can I get to another story? This one will certainly, I think, uh, excise a response from you. Soldiers and politicians have reacted with fury after British soldiers were told to make remem remembrance commemorations more inclusive by making them less Christian. So official army policy states that they should avoid making Armistice Day events on November the 11th wholly religious to avoid offending veterans of other religions and those without a religion, your reaction? Well, I think nobody would have been more offended uh, than those who gave their lives uh, for a Christian country. I think nobody would be more offended than that. Uh, and what we've never understood in this country is that respecting other faiths does not mean surrendering your own. I mean, when we were celebrating the millennium, I know it feels like a long time ago now, but when we were celebrating the millennium, it was seriously proposed by the then government, which was theirs, that we wouldn't have a prayer. Well, what was the millennium celebrating if it wasn't celebrating <laughs> 2,000 years of Jesus Christ? And this is the same sort of mentality. And people think the way you appeal to other faiths uh, is to uh, belittle your own. And other faiths don't understand it because they certainly don't make that line. Uh, worth remembering that this is a Christian country. Uh, speaking of which, Anne, uh, briefly if you can, Canterbury Cathedral have opened their doors to a late-night silent disco. This happened on Thursday. Uh, I think we might have some footage of this, so, Jonathan, if you're able to flash it up. Uh, I want to ask you whether this kind of event is appropriate in a church setting. This is hundreds of youngsters with big headphones on their ears dancing to music in a place of worship. What do you think, Anne? Well, I think it entirely depends on what sort of music they're dancing to. I doubt very much, somehow, from looking at it, as if they're singing Christian choruses. Uh, but if it were to be a religious music uh, event, that would be fine. If this is just a secular uh, event, such as you find on Friday nights in most towns, then no, it is not appropriate. And this, this cathedral is for the worship of Almighty God. Anne, thrilled to have you on the show, and I look forward to catching you in a week's time. My thanks to the formidable ex-government minister, broadcaster and television personality, Anne Widdicombe. Lots more to come, including tomorrow's papers with full pundit reaction. Don't go anywhere. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Lee Anderson's Real World.
Fridays from 7 p.m. Dr. Jane Jones, who's the clinical lead for Care After Combat. Yep. Jane, thanks for coming. And uh, just tell me a little bit about your organisation. What do you do? OK, well, thank you for having me here so we can talk about Care After Combat. So we are an organisation, a charity, who work into the prison system, working with military veterans who've somehow got involved with the justice system and... So there's, there's quite a high population of, of ex-service men and women in our prisons. Why is that, do you think? So 2014, the government did a review of who was resident in UK prisons and what they found were that military veterans are the highest occupational group. And this obviously raises some concerns. Yeah. So the government wanted to do something about that. And so they supported Care After Combat initially, just as a scoping exercise, really, to see if there was any way we could help these men and women at actually, you know, understand the problems that led to offending behaviour yeah. and go on to lead successful lives. So what sort of offending behaviour are we talking typically for, for people that's in prison that's actually served in our armed forces? Primarily it's uh, violence. Yeah. So that is the highest offence that, that we work with. Okay. But of course the military, as with everybody else, it's the full range of offending behaviour. Okay, so we're in a pub, Jane, Dr Jane. Uh, and I guess for some people, you know, the old tip of alcohol is good, uh, yeah. a bit of fun uh, of a weekend, relax, let your hair down. But for some people, alcohol is not always their best friend. And I guess that plays a, plays a part in some of your veterans that end up inside. Yeah. Absolutely. So, speaking from my own experience, a good two-thirds of the people I work with have some kind of mental health problem or mental health yeah. difficulty, struggling to either adapt into yep. civilian life or with some of the traumas they've experienced during service. People might self-medicate with alcohol to manage some of those thoughts and feelings. Yeah. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the Clown Show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's 10.30 and time for tomorrow's Front Pages. After Jewish groups condemn Starmer for standing by candidate who blamed Israel for Hamas atrocity, critics demand to know, so has Labour really changed? The I newspaper Jeremy Hunt braced for double budget blow this week. Official figures expected to show an increase in the rate of inflation and a possible re recession last year ahead of crucial budget in three weeks' time. Daily Express Grant Shapps, woke culture is poisoning common sense. Grant Shapps pledges to end the poisonous woke culture, which he says threatens to distract the military from its job of protecting the nation. This very much ties in with the topic of tonight's big opinion. The Defence Secretary warned that controversial leftist thinking has crept into the armed forces. He said the drumbeat of those who despise Britain is failing the army and the public and vowed to finally restore common sense in the services with a review of diversity rules. Here for my people, dutiful King's wave of gratitude for support. Daily Mirror. Kidnapped Alex at 18. My new life. Alex Batty has told of his life back in the UK after six years on the run in Europe. Guardian overseas students in push to clear names over English test cheating. And cousin of Gaza girl aged six, haunted by her last call. The Sun newspaper, uh, crowds cheer brave Charles. King's wave of hope is the headline. Metro, Biden versus Trump in war of words. Unhinged White House fury as ex-president claims I would encourage Putin to invade NATO countries. The Times, bonus ban for water bosses who break rules and candidate in anti-Semitism row backed by Starmer. Those are your front pages. Let's get full reaction now from tonight's top 
pundits. Former Labour Special Advisor Paul Richards, ex-BBC Chief Political Correspondent John Sargent and Journalist and Communications Advisor Linda Jubilee. OK, uh, listen, lots of stories to get through. Uh, we can't speak in any detail about candidates in the forthcoming by-elections, as you will all understand, due to election rules. Uh, but can we talk about whether or not Keir Starmer's got a problem with regards to Israel and his future premiership? Is that going to be a dividing line within his party? It's less of a dividing line than it was, I think. I mean, you may remember a few years ago, the front row of the Labour Party conference mm. were all there waving their Palestinian flags and there was not a single Israeli flag in sight. And I think that has long gone, though, though that attitude has long gone, where mm. you pick a side. Mm. Um, there are noises off, but he's sticking to his guns. And I think he's, he's you know, he said, well, I'm going to be the Prime Minister, possibly. Mm. Mm. I can't be a party of protest. I've got to be a party of government, and that's right. So do you think it's right that he's pushed back on calls for a ceasefire in the region. Well, what do you mean by a ceasefire? I mean, it only works if Hamas laid down their arms and there's and no return the hostages. Whatsoever. And the hostages must come home, those that are still mm. left alive. And that's a you know a really terrible situation. That's the most important thing, isn't it? So, you know, it's just a slogan unless Hamas lay down arms. Well, John, do you think that the issues in the Middle East could be a problem for a Starmer premiership? I think they're going to be a problem for us all. I mean, what we ha what the papers haven't caught up with yet is these these very firm line coming from the White House mm. to Israel saying. Now, look, if you go in to Rafa without a proper plan to protect civilians, we're not going to back you. Which well, is I mean, almost unprecedented, isn't it? That really... You know, if, if you take that as... You never know quite exactly what form it's been in. We'll have to mm. look at it more carefully. But maybe they've just, you know, losing, losing all patience with Israel. Mm. Mm. Now, if that happens, I think we've all discussed this over months, really, is it a credible policy to say we're going to destroy, to wipe out Hamas mm. and somehow protect the civilian population, even though Egypt won't accept refugees? Yeah. So where will people go? How will this work? Whatever happens, it seems to me, is it will take time. Netanyahu is saying, we press on, we're determined to do this. But he's not saying, oh, we can do it in a few weeks, just be patient for a bit longer. No, he's really saying, be patient perhaps for months. Now, that's going to press on, not just the United States, but the UK government, certainly. Cameron making it quite clear, Lord Cameron making quite clear that he's worried. People are just thinking this is going to be catastrophic. Mm. So it may be the timing of all this. You know, when can you destroy, how could you destroy Hamas in this way without a deal? It's all up in the air, isn't it? Very, very difficult. Well, indeed. I mean, you've got to ask yourself, uh, Linda, whether America could potentially disown Israel's action in Gaza. I mean, it's almost unbelievable, really, to start thinking that way. Mm. But it is getting to the point where it's very, very hard to feel mm. sympathy for Netanyahu's position here. I mean, you've got to remember as well that he's under a lot of political pressure at home, mm. so that's always a factor. But at the end of the day, Hamas is an ideology. You can't destroy an ideology. You can dismantle mm. the war machine of Hamas, though, can't you? You, you could. You could. But without but, killing but, lots of civilians. But, but how do you do that without killing lots of civilians? I don't believe that you can But actually... civilian casualties have been weaponised by Hamas, and this is the dilemma facing the Israelis. Sure, but that, that's an argument for how did it start and all yeah. that. Everyone ex can accept that. Mm. And there's you know. a disproportionate response, though. You'd have to say that there was a disproportionate response by Israel. But, but also the coverage, we have to say, because of all these people being killed day after day and the children being killed day after day and it being reported and we're mm. seeing it day after day, it, it is... People hate to see these pictures. I certainly They're do. They're horrible. Well, yes, you look at them truly and that little, that little kid saying, come and help me, come and help me, and she's her body is then discovered dead. I mean, it, now you may say, oh, well, it's in proportion to this and who started it and all the rest of it. But people's human reaction images. to these pictures, and it's, it shouldn't be underestimated. Cool people in the Foreign Office may say, oh, we're used to all this. Ordinary people watching not this at home it. in full colour, high definition, are terrified. And this is people, children being operated upon without anaesthetic, you know, doctors that are at the end of their tether. I think if you read the Sunday Times today and then they talk about going into Rafa, it's so frightening. Mm -hmm. well, well, it's interesting. The political right seem to be shifting position. This is in the Telegraph, tomorrow's Telegraph, Paul Richards. Tim Stanley, one of their top columnists, he's no lefty, and uh, the headline is, for Israel's sake, Netanyahu must go now. The Gaza war is the fault of Hamas, 
but the innocent are dying and it's beyond time for the killing to end. Mm. Well, mm. Hamas must be defeated and the hostages must come home. Mm. But then Israel needs to ask itself the question, who does it want to be its leader? Um, and, you know, we would argue that needs to be a regime change in Israel so that there's a more progressive, left-leaning Israeli leadership. Or at least more moderate. The, yeah, more moderate and more coming uh, so that the two-state solution can be put mm. back on the table. I mean, the, the tragedy of this situation is that Palestinian statehood is now further away than mm. it was before the mm. massacre. Oh, yeah. You know, and maybe this is Hamas's calculus that it wants this massive reaction. Yes. But yeah. uh, they still need to be defeated. You know, just as we did with other enemies like ISIS, they have to be militarily defeated. But you see, the initial reaction of Keir Starmer, which I'm sure was correct in terms of positioning, which was to make sure that he and the government were like that. And the reason for that was to sort of prove to the nation of doubters, the people in the middle, look, if he was prime minister, he would be in much the same position. And that is what, obviously, I think, Labour gained a great deal from that in terms of credit, credit and credibility. We're moving into a different era now where mm. every decision, every move is going to be analysed and there's sort of... To say to Keir Starmer, do you agree with that? Yes. Oh, and, and to say to Rishi Sunak, do you agree with that? We may be into that and it, it, to these vague talk about there must be a ceasefire and how about this and when, where. This may be coming to a completely different position quite quickly. Is the West ready to disown Israel? Let me know your thoughts. Mark at GBNews.com. Linda Jubilee, the I newspaper. Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, braced for a double budget blow this week. Fears that inflation could creep up mm -hmm. and the R word, potentially, recession. that, that, uh, that uh, we might have been in recession last year. Yeah, and there's all this talk, actually, about are we in a... will we be in a technical, technical. recession? Mm. I we'll mean, it's, yeah. it's like being technically pregnant, isn't it, at the end of the day? <laughs> yeah. mm. it, 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 this is a very, very difficult week for Jeremy Hunt. These are very, very bad... Points to the only thing that worries come. me is, are we being softened up, ready for mm -hmm. badish news rather than totally bad news? Mm -hmm. They've done this before. The Treasury has done this before, haven't they? We don't know the figures. They've got a pretty clear inkling now yeah. of what's expected. Are we just being told so that we'll think, oh, well, what a relief. Inflation's only gone up a bit. Mm, so do you, think, do you think we are... I mean, reading the mood music there, John, do you think we are being prepared for news that inflation's well, gone up? how does the eye know that we... Mm. <laughs> as it were, no... Yeah. The only, the only yeah. source for this kind of information <laughs> is the government. Yeah. What is the government's interest? The government's interest is, if it's bad-ish news, is to make it seem worse and then say, oh, people thought it was going to be terrible, but it's not so bad. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, listen, let's have a look at uh, a couple of other stories, if we can. Uh, this... Uh, there's another breaking story in The Telegraph. Former Dutch Prime Minister and his wife die hand in hand in double euthanasia. Uh, there you go. That's Holland with That's a very right. different attitude to this mm. procedure to the one we have here in the UK. Do we need to have a national conversation about this, Paul? We definitely do, actually. Mm. And I would even argue for a royal commission and get some experts around the table. I think the laws we have in, at the moment are so outdated and unfair and cruel to people mm. who want to take this course. You need the safeguards, of course you do, but other countries seem to be more enlightened. And I think we just need to have that, as you say, national conversation around y this. Yes, Esther Ranson has been campaigning yeah. with this as she's mm. suffering from terminal, terminal lung cancer, I think, Linda. Mm. And I, yeah, I wrote a, quite a big piece for the Telegraph um, not so long ago because my father died with vascular dementia and I spent the last two weeks by his bedside. Mm. The funny thing was that although to start with I felt like I was going to come down on the side of euthanasia and, and, and frankly, when you watch someone starve to death because they can't swallow, their brain can't tell them mm. how to swallow, mm. it is a truly horrific experience. Mm. Yeah. At the end of the day... My mother, my aunt and, and me, we all sat round the bed and, and it was a very, very meaningful experience. He wasn't conscious, so yeah. I then changed my mind. But you're right, Paul, because what we have to do is have these difficult conversations. Mm. You can't get anywhere until you start talking. And at the moment, we've kind of brushed this subject under the carpet. Of course, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a classic. Good on Esther Ramsey and also for bringing yeah, it up yeah. again. Also, for a long time, for many, many years, doctors behind the scenes, the more and more the drugs got better... Well, exactly. Mm. ...would ease people. Oh, absolutely, you know. absolutely. absolutely. So, you know, it's all very well. Yeah. Short of extra morphine, that's this, right. This needs yeah. to... We need yeah. to discuss it. 
it properly in the open in public. We yeah. do. How about this very potential political bombshell in the United States, John Sargent? This is in the Express. Disaster for Donald Trump as Michelle Obama, former first lady, mm. could replace Joe Biden as presidential candidate for 2024. That would throw oh. a cat among the pigeons, wouldn't it? Well, I, I, mean, <laughs> I just feel that, that Biden's time is it's, over. It's, go, it's I, gone, yeah. I, but I, I, the Americans are... They've got all sorts of skills, haven't they? And this is <laughs> a pretty well sort of caricature, but when they need to act, they'll act, won't they? And I just... I can't imagine them just sort of rambling on and not concentrating and letting him become the, the candidate. It, it's I, I, I just it's doesn't off. seem very American. It's, it's, it's for the Americans to because say, they're, Come they're on. all about presentation, aren't they? And they're all about decisions and hard times, and we got to do it, and, yeah. and all this thing. And Dynamic. Okay, okay. He looks stereotyping too them, but he, he looks completely, utterly unsuitable for the for the debates. Apart from anything else, can you imagine him being one to one uh, with Trump in a debate with with someone in between saying, "What about this? How about that? Is he going to cope with that?" He's given very few interviews as president. I think it's a third the number that you'd expect mm. at the same stage. Mm. He's not up to it. It's, th this guy wasn't making it up. That's he may have been a Republican, mm. the guy that was judging him um, uh, over the, uh, the release of files, that he that was what he was... He was judging him on that and finding him, in fact, OK, that he wouldn't be charged, but partly because he didn't think he could stand up to the judicial inquiry. Well, I mean, uh, and, yet, and yet he's the leader of the free world with access to the nuclear codes. Do you think that Biden is, is potentially weeks or a couple of months away from relinquishing power, Paul? I am a huge Joe Biden fan, and it is tragic to see what's happening, but I think there is some truth yeah. into the, in this, which he is becoming increasingly unlikely to be the candidate. Mm. Uh, because I think his um, faculties are failing, and that's what we see. You know, we can see the evidence for our own eyes. So I think it's very sad, do you think and I think he's a good thing. Do you but think I he's been think... thrown under the bus by well, Democratic do... Party I mean, insiders? John, John's right, isn't he? The, the Democrats, the strategists, the, the money men, you know, they'll all look at this situation and go, look, this guy's making Trump look good. Mm. You know, this is not a good situation for us to be in. Um, maybe there's a better candidate in the wings. So who is Michelle the candidate or whoever that, that else? I don't Trump know. Would, would fear? Because the, the, the front runner would be the... Governor of California, Gavin Newsom. Well, there are lots of people coming through. Um, I mean, the Michelle mm. Obama thing is really fascinating because who knows better how the White House runs? You know, who has better empathy with the American people? She's a great communicator, yeah. Mm -hmm. great speech maker, great backstory. You know, what's not to like? Great I mean, excitement too. Great excitement. It? But also, she's yeah. not a divisive figure. She'd have not at all. She with, really with, all of, with, with many yeah. Americans, many yes. floating voters. Absolutely. It'd be rather marvellous, wouldn't it? But what would be the mechanism to get her into play? That's what I'm not quite clear Well, on. they'll make it up. If, they, if there isn't one there, they'll, they'll change the law <laughs> and they'll change the rules. I mean, there you yes, go. Yes, well, what do you think, folks? Are, are you ready for another Obama in the White House? <laughs> Stranger things have happened. Uh, let me tell you that we've been conducting an exclusive Mark Dolan Tonight People's Poll. We've been asking, should Nigel Farage join the Conservative Party? while well, the results are in. I shall reveal all next, plus more from the papers. See you in two. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes and Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. Mike Freer joins me now. Mike, thank you very much for coming well, into thank the Thank you for inviting me. Um, firstly, how are you? It's been a busy day and uh, it's been a... Quite a traumatic experience. It's a, it's a real wrench to walk away from a job that you love, but also a constituency that um, you've become... You know, I live there, it's my home, and I regard many of my constituents as friends, and um, it is an amazing, amazing place. And to walk away from that um, is really quite... Uh, it's quite an emotional um, wrench to think this was a job I loved, and, but unfortunately I can't do it anymore. Can you talk me through the process? Because you mentioned about the... You know, alleged arson attack, etc., being the final straw. Mm. But this has been a really quite vile journey to get to this point. So, what kind of threats have you had? What's that look like? 
Well, like every MP, I mean, you, you, day in, day out, you get abusive emails, you get low-level stuff that, whether we should accept it, but we do, it's graffiti, you know, it's um, things like, you know, I've had, in the past I've had a mock Molotov cocktail left on the office door, meaning we had to evacuate the whole building. I've come out, and, out of my house and found, a, a, you know, a note on my car. Um, where I live is common knowledge, but what I drive is less so. And it's a few weeks after uh, John Mann had had the wheel nuts on his car tampered with. So that... All kind of makes you get a bit, you know, what on earth's going on. But I, I've had two run-ins with the organisation that was Muslims Against Crusades and people like Anjum Chowdhury, um, who was behind that organisation, um, been to prison. But online it said, I, I used to do surgery mo in mosques, uh, surgery mosques, so I wanted to go yeah. out and see people. And online there's a picture of me saying, you're not welcome in our, uh, our mosque, let Stephen Timms be a pointed reminder... So it's not very subtle. Well, just for our viewers and listeners who might not remember that... Stephen that Timms, mean? of course, was stabbed um, by a woman who'd been radicalised. Um, thank heavens he survived. So it was a very unsubtle. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now, we've been conducting a Mark Dolan tonight people's poll. We've been asking, should Nigel Farage join the Conservative Party? Well, very interesting result. Not a landslide, but 60.5% say no, but 39.5% say yes. And I suspect those people voting yes are disgruntled Tory voters who would like Nigel to rescue their party. Will it happen? Well, Nigel hasn't ruled it out. Watch this space. Uh, reacting to the big stories of the day. What a brilliant set of pundits I've enjoyed with me tonight. Former Labour Special Advisor Paul Richards, ex-BBC Chief Political Correspondent John Sargent, and Journalist and Communications Advisor Linda Dubley. And uh, let's now get my nominations, please, uh, for my pundits for Headline Hero and Back Page Zero of the day. So, who's your hero of the day, Paul? Well, uh, you won't be surprised to know it's King Charles, and I am no great fan of monarchy as an institution, but him as a man, I think, has done enormous good, and particularly raising awareness of cancer. Mm. Men of my age and maybe a little older are going for getting, getting tests now, yeah. um, and he will have saved lives by raising this issue to the prominence that it has, so good for him. Well, uh, the cat's out the bag, because all three of you have nominated King Charles mm. as your headline hero. Mm -hmm. Why have you what, what, do we, what do we get for three kings? Is that well, well, that's it, yeah. It, there are all, all things that, that Paul mentioned, but I think there are lots of things. I mean, it's, partly it's the story of the man who's waited all his life and he then gets into this position and mm. natural sympathy for him, but also his feeling that, right, what would my mother do? Mm. And very much keep the show on the road. No question of, oh, what about abdication and like that. Nothing to do with that, but turn up for church, uh, take your own umbrella... Your wife, the Queen, could also take her umbrella. But just be there. And there are lots of times with the royal family when it's not what you say, and the Queen was, of course, brilliant at all this. It's just where are you standing, what are you doing, mm. who are you standing with, what are you displaying? And I think that his, it, the way that he's played this, I think, has been... Absolutely brilliant. And his letter of thanks to the British public was just wonderfully put, Perfectly it? worded mm. version, actually, I thought. I read that mm. this morning. Very, very humble. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't haughty or in any no, way no, regal, no, was it? Every word was, was perfect in that letter. Yeah. But also, can I just say that people say, you know, he's, how unlucky he's waited 70 years for this job, how unlucky he has been. I don't think he's unlucky because I think this will be the making of him. Really? Now, why do you say that? Because I think that he has been brave enough to be open about a condition. Mm. He has spurred on attention. Mm. He's focused attention upon it. He will undoubtedly have encouraged many men to come mm. forward for testing. And, and, and he waived his right to privacy. Yeah. Um, it would have been harder for him to cover up this kind of thing. It much harder yeah. than it would have been decades ago. It would have probably come out anyway. But he made a clear, concise decision. And I think his communications team did a brilliant job with it. Most definitely. Uh, to me, Jonathan, if you would, listen, uh, I don't normally nominate a headline hero, but I've got absolutely no hesitation 
in nominating my colleague, Patrick Christie's, right? What a talented guy, what a lovely bloke. And he spoke so movingly and honestly on GB News this morning about his struggles with alcoholism, over which he has prevailed magnificently. He looks great now. His body's a temple. And so well done, Patrick, on your amazing recovery. A really nice story in the Mail on Sunday about that. So mm. big on you, big guy. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow at nine. OK, what about head, uh, back page zeros of the day? Who, who, uh, who's who got the thumbs down tonight, Paul? Well, I think Tucker Carlson should be in a dock, <laughs> frankly, for providing Putin with this platform. platform to undermine the West and to spout his propaganda unchallenged. It'd be like turning up to interview Hitler and saying, what's your favourite colour, Adolf? Right, yeah, so Tucker Carlson, disgraceful. one of the best-known broadcasters in the world, of course, fired from Fox News in April of last year. What was he thinking? Uh, I mean, do you not want to try to understand the motivations behind... Putin's actions is that not was that not the purpose of the? But you don't do that without scrutiny and questioning. If mm. you just allow him to spout on this sort of half-baked history of Russian imperialism and his you know so-called claims on territories and all the rest of it, it was just a disaster. And uh, you know it was unchallenged. But do, do we just... not? I mean, I, I'm no Putin fan. Let me assure you. But do, do we not want to engage with these people? in order to hopefully resolve this issue. Well, if you give an interview, you should expect some scrutiny. Imagine if Sargent had turned up and just sat there and let no. him speak John would have made him into me. Probably can't imagine, imagine that. I would have cut him pieces. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you should no, I wish, I wish. No, the only thing... I mean, well, the, just the elements of Even as a professional journalist, how can he say that other journalists didn't bother to interview Putin? I mean, that that's just a straightforward lie. It's very offensive to people like the BBC, Steve yes, Rosenberg. Yes, exactly. Um, and it's mm. just totally, it's totally. So the idea that I'm a great professional okay. reporter, I get the big story. Oh yeah, Linda. A couple of seconds. What, why? Uh, why? What, do you think it was a good or a bad interview with Tucker Carlson? I think it was quite difficult to listen to. Technically, mm. quite difficult to listen to. Mm. And there was nothing in it that really um, that, that had it any real merit. Well, at there you all. go. Well, let me yeah, say my pundits great. had merit tonight. Uh, Linda, by the way, had Thames water. I'm assuming for dirty, polluted water. Oh my goodness, Thames water. Outrageous. And the other, and um, the other I'm back on Friday at eight. Headliners is next. That warm feeling inside from boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello there, good evening. I'm Jonathan Vautry here with your GB News weather forecast provided by the Met Office. For the next few days, the theme really is clear spells and showers around, and we have that really as we end Sunday as well. Showers pushing their way in from the west, quite frequent for some western districts. Some clearer spells, though, further towards the east and a much drier night overall, though for the far northeast here in Shetland, it is going to be a much wetter one with that band of rain sweeping through. Underneath some of those clear spells, though, temperatures will just drop off a bit. Low single figures for many of us, and Apache frost is possible first thing. On Monday morning, maybe some icy stretches as well, where we do have those showers around. We will continue to see those showers pushing their way in. They will be most frequent and heaviest for northwestern areas. Some quite blustery winds around here at times also. But generally further east and south, you'll more likely stay dry throughout the day with a decent number of sunny spells in there as well. A relatively pleasant start to the new week. Temperatures around 6 to 11 degrees Celsius is pretty much where we'd expect them to be for this time in the year. On Tuesday, we've got an area of low pressure just to the north that will again bring some very breezy, blustery showers for Scotland. But a ridge of high pressure allows for a drier, finer start for much of Northern Ireland, England and Wales with some sunny spells once again. But we will start to see the cloud thickening up from the southwest with outbreaks of rain eventually arriving turning breezier as well. But in amongst all of this, we have milder air sweeping its way in. So temperatures will be on the rise as we head towards the middle part of the week, seeing mid-teens for some of us as we head towards Wednesday. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London-Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7pm. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Pretty mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel.
Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. Are you across this microaggression story? I, I'm across microaggressions. I'm also it's, across it's, XL bullies. You would not last five minutes. Oh, for this. God's so sake. Civil servants, give me strength. So civil servants have been taught not to roll their eyes.